All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're coming back from our break here, and we're going to pick up our work on S17. And um, we'll begin with testimony from uh, the network. Karen, are you live there? Great. I think you're still muted. I'm here and I'm muted, but now I'm on mute. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, if you could introduce yourself for the record, and I think you had some testimony to offer about um, the standby uh, services issue. Thanks so much, Chair McCartney. Uh, McCarthy. I'm so glad to be here. I'm Karen Tronsgaard Scott, and I work at the Vermont Network, where my role is as its executive director. Thank you, committee, for the opportunity to testify today on S17. Um, we want to address a, a small but critically important issue in Section 6 of S-17, uh, sheriffs accompanying survivors to retrieve personal belongings, often referred to as, this is standby. Um, sheriffs often accompany survivors to their homes so they can safely cl collect their possessions after a relief from abuse order has been issued. Many sheriffs charge for this, um, charge fees for this service, but many do not charge. So that's worth noting. Because the fees are most often not affordable for survivors, our member, our 15 member organizations are frequently put in a position of trying to find the funds to be able to pay the sheriffs for uh, this service. Often they are asking members of the community to cover the cost or church, local churches, uh, or they, they find the money within their own budgets. The fees range from $75 an hour to $150 an hour and often include a minimum number of hours as well as a charge for mileage. Some sheriff's department, um, as I said earlier, some sheriff's departments cover this cost and some, some do not. The, um, combined, the um, nonprofit organizations uh, in, our, in our community and our community members, as well as survivors themselves, are paying thousands of dollars a year to access protection when re removing belongings in the wake of violence. I want to make a note that across our state, from DCF to VSP to town police departments, there's a unified commitment to enhance survivor um, safety at, at every turn. And I wanna really thank the Vermont State Police as well as our local police departments for continuing to provide this service at no cost to survivors. It, 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 um, it's really clear that they have a deep commitment to survivor safety and community safety. We have a couple concerns about, um, about current practice that I, I'm uh, very happy to share with you. First of all, charging survivors access to safety. So for survivors who need to uh, remove items pursuant to a relief from abuse order, standby assistance from law enforcement agencies is, um, sh it should be provided free of charge to these citizens. It's noteworthy that the state of Vermont has made policy decision to cover the cost of domestic violence offender accountability programs at no cost to those offenders. Um, and we fully support that policy, but it is noteworthy that survivors are simultaneously charged in order to safely remove, remove belongings from, from their abusive home. Also, um, we no, we're noting that there's an, a geographic inequity uh, around this policy. There's wide variation and a lack of consistency in the fees charged, in whether they are charged. Uh, and again, some sheriff's departments never charge fees and some charge as much as $150 an hour and often with a three hour minimum plus mileage. So you can see that these costs are incredibly prohibitive for survivors. Um, so there's really significant geographic injustice uh, across our state based on this, this approach. So we're asking, um, we've had some conversations with the Sheriff's Association and the network is requesting the language in S-17 um, to ensure that the sheriffs provide this assistance without uh, charging a fee to the survivor or any of their representatives. And we um, agree with the sheriffs that we can have a conversation over the course of the summer to collect more data uh, and assess the the needs, especially in relationship to collecting uh, to for um, defendants to be able to collect their possessions. So uh, I've sent a copy of um, some some requested language to you, uh, and what that does is establish uh, that the sheriff's departments will will offer these services and they will offer them at no cost to survivors. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And thank you. Um... 
I'll open it up to the committee, but I'll go first here. I um, am wondering if you saw in the last couple of drafts, so we now have a draft 3.1 that just came out um, that was just posted within the last 30 minutes or so. And um, it maintains the spirit of, of that section 60 that came over to us in the S17 Senate as passed, um, but tries to clarify a little bit that it's not exclusively the duty of sheriffs if there are other law enforcement agencies that so the language that came over from the Senate could be interpreted, we have heard in testimony as the sheriffs being the exclusive providers of standby services, which I don't think was the network's intent. But I just wanted to clear that out from your perspective that something like this that basically says survivors aren't going to be charged. Um, if sheriffs are requested to provide the service, they shall, but they won't be the only law enforcement agency providing standby service. That that well, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't seen that latest version, but based on what you're describing, Chair McCarthy, it sounds like it meets the intent of um, and will solve the, the, the issue that we're concerned about. The, and as I said earlier, there's a long history of um, town police uh, officers as well as the Vermont State Police of providing this service um, without charging survivors. That's, and so that's part of the, the information that we need to collect. <clears throat> is where are these services being provided? How are they being provided? By whom are they being provided? And, um, and uh, you know, how does, that, how does that all configure for survivors? And I'm, I'm looking at um, the suggested language in uh, the written testimony that you provided. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the addition that you're suggesting here is um, a required you know, report back or collaboration between the network and um, the Sheriff's Association. It seems like there's already a, a dialogue about that. Do you, do you feel strongly that we need to add that to the bill or is that something that the Sheriff's Association and the network could probably do without the statutory language? Well, you know, we've had some really great conversations with the sheriffs and the and the good news about those conversations is that I think that we have a unity of vision. So in our conversation with the Sheriff's Association, we recognize that that we all agree that this is the most dangerous point in in the in a an abusive relationship, the point at which a relief from abuse order is issued and the survivor is, is leaving the shared home. So we all know that uh, and agree that this is it's important for us to get this right. The um, it's actually the, the suggestion of the Sheriff's Association that we get together over the summer and take a look at this so that we can come back next year and and have more information. We need we need a lot more information. We need data and um, and then be able to come back next year with an actual um, uh, long term plan. So whether or not it is in statutory language, of course, we would love to see it in statutory language, but understand that you, you know you may want may not wish to do that. But again, this was this was the idea of the Sheriff's Association. So I would be interested to know if they also, you know, if they, what they what their opinion would be about having an, it, it, uh, the provision in statutory language. But before I ask uh, Sheriff Anderson from the, the association to come up, do, does anybody on the committee have any questions for Karen, Representative Hickley? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Karen. I guess uh, maybe you said this. Um, how many RFEs uh, are there in a, in, a, in a given year, roughly? Well, uh, in a given year across our state, there were about, uh, about 2,000 RFAs issued. Uh, on, the, on a temporary basis. So RFAs go through a two-step process. There's a temporary RFA, and then which lasts for about two weeks. And then there's a hearing that's held and a, and a permanent RFA is issued. And, and there's about a 50% drop-off between those, the, the issuance of a temporary RFA and the issuance of a permanent RFA. So about 1,000 RFAs are issued a year. Not all of those RFAs are um, held by survivors who feel like they need standby. So that's one of the questions that we need to collect um, data on is, you know, how many people are we talking about here? Then uh, just to follow up to, I think you said, does it cost your network a th thousands of dollars a year or how much does it? Well, we don't have that information because uh, what I've referred to is it costs in, in, in those places, 
where there's a fee charged and the network program has the ability to support the survivor, then the network program will support the survivor. But they don't, it's not, there's no line item for this. They they might talk to a local church and ask them for money or or to a benefactor of the organization and ask ask them for money. Uh, but survivors very often, uh, you know, many survivors never contact the network program. And so they're out there on their own and they're actually paying out of pocket for the service. And so we know that there's, a, you know, we do, we do know that there's enough people across our state that are paying, you know, upwards of $600 uh, for, for the service. So we know that there's thousands of dollars that are being spent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Karen? Um, well, Sheriff Anderson, if you're willing to speak to this particular issue at this point, I, since you're in the room, I think it might be useful. <laughs> Good morning. For the record, Mark Anderson, president of the Vermont Sheriff's Association. Uh, so you've heard me say this before. Um, this is compelling us to do something. Uh, in a way, uh, but also says let's study it. Um, so to the question of do we need the study, we certainly are willing to work with the network to do that. I don't think we need statute to do that, but really I don't see, um, I, I don't see need in the sense of gathering the data of what the collaboration is, but they'd be a natural partner to collaborate with. The reason I say that is because we'd be the one providing the service. So it would just all be internal to us. Um, we, the Sheriff's Association, uh, instead of, uh, so there's an interpretation that this doesn't, uh, does not preclude uh, the state police or municipal police departments, and certainly do not want to suggest that they're uh, not unwilling to do these, but often our experiences in communities that the state police and municipal police departments cover, we're receiving the calls. I've done these in Brattleboro, where they have a full service police department. I've done these in communities where the state police are the sole provider of services. So to that end, the reason why the Sheriff's Association um, is concerned about the compulsion is because uh, if, uh, as written, it says, the uh, if we provide law enforcement in the county, well, I have 23 towns of which 15 contract with me for law enforcement. So. Brattleboro does not contract with me for law enforcement. How do I pay my staff? How do I pay for the car to go to Brattleboro to sit there for four to eight hours while the U-Haul trucks filled up? And that's where we start to um, run into issues. We received information from the judiciary yesterday that there's over 6,000 uh, relief from abuse orders that were issued in fiscal year 22. If I drop that even by half, because uh, we they were not able to track uh, which required law enforcement presence. But if we cut that in half, that's 3,000 RFAs. If we assume even just four hours to load the U-Haul truck, um, then, I mean, we're talking 27,000 manpower hours or personnel hours. And so this, this is where we become concerned about how do we pay for this? How do I tell my deputy to volunteer? Uh, obviously, I can't. So then it comes into the internal operations of each individual department, the financial resources of each individual uh, department. Uh, and I think our consistent message has been, if we're going to be required to do this, please provide us some resources to do it. Um, so we, I agree with, um, uh, with Ms. Tronsgaard Scott that uh, we have a shared vision Victims shouldn't pay for this. Survivors shouldn't pay for this. There's a, um, a variety of circumstances where these are not ideal circumstances. But we've never been provided the resources to do this in the first place, which is why victims were uh, asked through the Victims Compensation Fund uh, under the prior administration uh, to pay for it, which is how we ended up in a circumstance where we were getting reimbursed because the victim was getting reimbursed through the Victims Compensation Fund. So. That's not an ideal system. We've learned that through this bill. Um, I'm just concerned that this does create language that will cause municipal departments to say, well, it says uh, they can ask the sheriff, so ask the sheriff, because there's complete silence on who's responsible for this otherwise in state statute. Representative, I guess, where does this money come from that's in the victim's compensation fund? I would not be a good person to answer that question, but I understand it is not generally considered not sufficient. And I fundamentally agree that what we did was a workaround. 
but not a good solution. Um, talking with the executive director of uh, Victims Compensation very briefly uh, and talking with John Campbell at uh, DSAS, uh, I think the policy is agreeable that it shouldn't come from Victims Compensation that's identified for other reasons. But then where does it come from? Um, so I, I mean, Mr. Chair, if I may offer a simple tweak, um, the language uh, in 3.1, if we say, uh, in uh, delete county and remove, uh, I'm sorry, replace it with uh, the primary law enforcement agency. Every municipality through its E911 coordinator has to identify their emergency services. That's true in all 250, I guess, two towns now um, and the incorporated villages. Uh, so they designate that to the state of Vermont. There's a clear registry of who's responsible for this, um, for law enforcement in any jurisdiction in the state of Vermont. It seems to be a realistic thing because they're already resourced to provide this. Uh, and while it continues as an unfunded mandate uh, to that point, um, these are departments that are resourced. If my, my agency provides services in the town of Putney, which we do um, for law enforcement, then we would be the ones providing it through our contract with the town of Putney. But then I'm not required to do it in the town of Brattleboro where I have no, no resource. Just for clarification, uh, where is that wording in Buddha Dine? So it's in section six, correct? Yeah. So B? D. D. Okay, and it would be so, primary law enforcement agencies, correct? Correct. Uh, what I'm proposing is to delete on line 19 providing law enforcement services for the county, Delete County, and replace that with law enforcement services. Uh, for the town. Uh, and I guess introduce. Something to the effect of saying whoever provides the primary law enforcement coverage for a community as opposed to just the Sheriff's Department. I think it still accomplishes the network's goal of having law enforcement present. Um, and those are in communities that are already resourcing law enforcement. Well, um, does the committee have any other questions for Sheriff Anderson? Thank you. Uh, or Representative Waters Evans, go ahead. Thank you. So who makes the call asking for the assistance? So the, the general process is that uh, when a relief from abuse order is issued, uh, there's I'm gonna summarize it as two processes that might be a little uh, high level, but um, Process number one is an emergency process. There's a 24 7 800 number. Uh, process number two is the, the judiciary, a, a judge giving opportunity for um, either the survivor themselves uh, or the survivor and the, um, I'll call it the defendant, the plaintiff and the defendant uh, to come before the court. Uh, and so those are the temporary and the uh, what will eventually become the final relief from abuse order. The judiciary is the one who would dictate that um, a defendant, or in some cases it does happen, a plaintiff is required uh, or is allowed to go to a property uh, in the presence of law enforcement to uh, obtain their property. The uh, temporary relief from abuse orders, uh, and this is a very common practice, uh, temporary orders, usually it's 15 minutes, get the toothbrush, get the laptop, get change of clothes, someone staying in a hotel or a friend's house or, or whatever that may be. On final order, so it's get the bed, get the dresser, uh, get the, the dog, the cat. Um, it can be several uh, U-Haul loads. Uh, it can be several hours. We've had uh, some go multi-day. Uh, so we're not talking uh, an insignificant amount. Uh, we're gonna, uh, so uh, back to your question. Um, as written in this draft, it would be the victim I'm sorry, the survivor who is requesting the service of the department. Um, the 
I believe I, I read that correctly, uh, and they would be the triggering event. Uh, there's also, um, I don't think it's a significant issue, uh, but we want to make sure that there's not uh, third party contact between the plaintiff and the defendant in the order. Uh, and so generally law enforcement transacts the arrangement of this. So there's also some logistical work that leads into it. Thanks. Representative Hango. Thank you. I just want to clarify with Ms. Tronsgaard that um, the victim doesn't actually, I'm sorry, the survivor doesn't actually have to pick up the phone to call a law enforcement agency that your network would help with that and maybe make the call for them? You're muted, sorry. Sorry about that. If the victim is working with a member organization, then certainly we would help them make that call. Okay. But not great. all victims work with our member organizations. Understood, but if you are involved, you would be able to make the call for that person. We would help them make the call. We wouldn't necessarily you know, it, we would do whatever they needed us to do. Great, thank you. Thank you. Other questions from our witnesses on this? I, I, I wanna have a little bit of a committee discussion about exactly what to do with this, se this section because I wanna try to give Mr. Devlin some direction. Um, mm -hmm. So, Sheriff Anderson, thank you. Uh, thank you. Stick with us. So, at, so just kind of zooming out, as this bill came over to us from the Senate, this was basically uh, just a, a straight up sheriff shall provide this service. They won't charge survivors. Um, the language that's before you in 3-1 was an attempt to say sheriffs will provide this assistance upon a quest, but to not preclude the primary law enforcement agencies from providing sample service. Representative Hango. Thank you. I'm just going to throw some language out there that maybe we say um, the individual um, who requires assistance um, would contact the primary law enforcement agency. Um, and that could include the okay. sheriff's department for that community for that community and community could mean town county village state state yes because some communities have no law enforcement um contracts so here's okay. representative yeah. go ahead no this is <laughs> i don't want to dominate this conversation but um i guess my my question is about the service is being provided now. I understand like that's not not happening if it's needed. Right. So I'm just wondering if we need to um, require who does it in this bill or if the issue is really um, making sure that the um, survivor doesn't have to pay for it. Because it, it sounds like we don't want to require an agency to do it if they have no funds to do it. And also if we don't want to require the survivor to pay for it. So I'm wondering, you know, where is the exact thing that we need to put in the bill? That's a great question. That is exactly the, the trouble here. Uh, there seems to be broad agreement from the network sheriffs, most of us, I think, that we don't want survivors to have to pay for the service in a time where they're fleeing mm -hmm. and they've been granted a relief from abuse or whether it's temporary or final. And there's also the acknowledgement that this can really rack up serious hours. Um, so my, uh, I think that what we're left with here is that we really need the data. So I'm sort of hearing this conversation inclined to adopt something like the language uh, that Ms. Transcott Scott put in there, um, but to also soften the, the languages I'm hearing from um, a couple of the comments here that there's a desire to sort of say, well, this isn't just the sheriff providing the service now. We want to make sure there aren't any primary law enforcement agencies in any communities that are charging survivors. So what's good for sheriffs should be good for all of those. But really, we need to come back to this next year and either say the state is going to pay for these hours or we really think that, you know, municipal <laughs> state and, and county law enforcement agencies can absorb the, the cost. Right now, we don't have the data to know you know, the sort of back of the envelope math about relief from abuse orders, I've heard that it could be, you know, a couple hundred incidents a year uh, that really have the multiple hour, you know, it's the big move with the final 
relief from abuse order up to could be thousands. I don't think it's thousands, but we have no way of knowing based on the testimony we've heard. And there isn't one consistent repository of that data from what uh, our witnesses have told us. So I think it's hard to, it's hard for us to in this bill totally solve the problem. I think my primary goal would be to say, we're not gonna have survivors pay for this period. And then over the next year, I think we should make a commitment to get that data and then come back to this issue next year. That's that's where I'm starting to land, but I want to hear from everybody else. I uh, represent him. Thank you. So that would um, mean the additional letter E from the network's um, proposed language, which is the study. But I was looking back at their proposed language D that, that they proposed that says um, sheriff's departments providing law enforcement services in the county in which an individual who has a relief from abuse order resides shall have a duty to assist in the retrieval of personal belongings, et cetera. Um, and I, I, I think we could put something in there um, that refers to absent another primary law enforcement agency being responsible in that municipality or that community. Um, it would default then somehow to the sheriff and instead of saying a sheriff's department shall not seek a fee, I would say any law enforcement agency should not seek, shall not seek a fee from the individual being assisted. So I think the first part of what you're suggesting is what I tried to get uh, with Mr. Devlin's help. And after the feedback we heard from the Sheriff's Association on this issue before. Um, so if you look at 3.1D, now it reads, if an individual who has a relief from abuse order requires assistance in the retrieval of personal belongings and the individual requests assistance from a sheriff's department providing law enforcement services in for the county, which that individual resides, the sheriff's department shall provide the assistance. Okay, that, that was meant to make it so that if they go to the sheriff and ask the sheriff, the sheriff will provide it, but not to exclude whoever the primary law enforcement um, agency is in, in their town. So if you're in Burlington, you're probably going to call the Burlington PD, not the Chittenden County Sheriff's Office. It would be my assumption, right? Or if you're in the city of St. Albans, you're going to call the St. Albans Police Department, not the Franklin County Sheriff. Maybe, though. I don't know if the individual is making the call themselves, if they would make that specific choice. So that's why I kind of wanted to make it sound like um, if there's another primary law enforcement, then that's who they should get directed to if it's a primary law enforcement agency for that community. So like St. Albans PD. Um, but if you're living in Berkshire, it wouldn't be because there is no Berkshire PD. It would be likely the VSP or the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. But because Berkshire doesn't contract with the Sheriff's Office, it, didn't ha it doesn't have to be. You know, the Sheriff's Office is not Berkshire's primary um, law enforcement agents. So I think that's where the, the difference might come in in the wording, although I think we're getting close in letter D of 3.1. I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, Representative Brim and Representative Morgan. If I heard your entire correctly, um, your example, we're going to call BPD first. And then sure. BPD is the primary. I think normally they would do it, but staffing being what it is, they're doing it now. And I would imagine that we don't put something in that says we have to have a valid reason. You're the primary, blah, 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 something that maintains some kind of expectation that the primary will do something that everybody thinks left it off to the chair. Well, I think that's true. That could happen. Yes, so. it could very well happen. Stuff. And in the case of Berkshire, it may be that nobody wants to respond because nobody feels primarily responsible to That's the town of Ber Berkshire. <laughs> yeah. Representative Morgan. Yeah, I just along with obviously the same vein. Um, I, I think. Rep. Hagel might be on this something in the absence of a primary law enforcement in that community, law enforcement agent in that community, then 
the sheriff is the default. I, I think something to that effect would do the trick <clears throat> because it should. I mean, in, in my town in Milton, we have a PD. We've got, you know, almost 20 officers that we should be handling these. We shouldn't be calling the Chinook County Sheriff and going, hey, get on down here and do our work because that would be, I would say, a, a function of our PD. So I, something to that effect, yeah, I, I like that in the absence of a primary uh, law enforcement entity in that community, so blah, 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 something like that. Tim could advise us on that, I guess. Yeah, so it sounds like there's, there's, a, uh, there's a broad agreement that if I understand Representative Morgan and Representative Pango, um, that we should make sure that we're not having the, the sheriff be the kind of like automatic go to, but that they should be the backstop. Yeah. Um, and uh, that no law enforcement agency should be charging survivors, that we should put a, a prohibition that's broader than just the sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. Um, and that we should add something like um, the new paragraph E right. that um, Ms. Tronstar Scott gave us. Uh, Tim, do you need further clarity uh, on what we're looking for, if that's the consensus from the committee? Representative Hango. Thank you. I have one other question, too, that probably can't be addressed right here, but what happens to those unbillable hours like how is that how is that going to be covered if we are going to rely on a specific law enforcement agency who was in the past charging fees i mean i'm concerned for their bottom line as well especially the long ones right yeah so i think that um it's going to be hard for us to solve that in the context yeah. of this bill without that report back but this is really something that we should put on our agenda for when we get back in January, when we have some data and say, how much is it really costing the state to provide the services when survivors flee and figure out a funding mechanism for it. Um, I, if I knew what the number is, I'd march across the hall right now and yeah. say, hey, we hey can we yeah. figure out how to find this? Um, yeah. but, and do we need to specify that in section 10 with the report or not? Uh, well, um, with, this is a broader issue, I think, than just sheriffs. And I think the, what, the report back in Section 10 is really talking about sheriffs. So um, I think that this, the, the clarity that we're asking for with the, the sheriff and the network to come back to us with a sense of how big is this issue? Um, how many RFAs are there that require standby service? How many is it a, a quick, you know, it's, it's just an hour no big deal versus you know the multi-hour stops and all that stuff one, okay, go ahead. one last suggestion then on the network's letter e where it's asking that the sheriff's association work with the vermont network to gave, gather data i think that it should include more than just the vermont sheriff's association it should include other law enforcement agencies because we have no way of tracking right what other law enforcement agencies are which calls they're going on for this particular specific reason. I mean, if we need to know how much it's costing overall, do we need to know for even the law enforcement agencies who don't charge for that service? I mean, I kind of think we do. Because what if they decide not to be in that business anymore and put it off on the sheriffs? Then we would have a big picture of what it's costing statewide. I mean, I think it would just involve maybe one other group meeting with them, to give their input. Wouldn't it be local police departments, sheriff's departments, state police? Yeah, so it's three groups total. And the sheriffs? Maybe, or the bottom two could switch. Mm -hmm. I mean, not putting in that order, but I'm saying if you're really going to do a comprehensive study, then you go for it. Yeah. And then you're just going to gather all of that information for the report, which is time and money <clears throat> that they clearly have an abundance of. <laughs> and also, I appreciate the this new position that we're creating the executive director. Oh, wait, no. 
director of sheriff's operations. Yes. <laughs> so like yeah, new, we got a new title here. <laughs> Good job, <laughs> Representative Wooden. <laughs> <laughs> Is there not somebody within public safety who could take the data from this report? I mean, right now it looks like it would just be the sheriffs sitting down with the network. So I think what we will find with the network and the sheriffs is that since the sheriffs are the ones that are filling the gaps that aren't covered, yeah. is how, how many how many total RFAs are there and a sense of the proportionality, we might not hear, I think it will be, as I'm thinking this through, it would be really cumbersome to ask the network and the sheriffs to consult with every single law enforcement agency in the state. Right. Yeah. But the sheriffs are the ones filling the gaps all across the state. So we're gonna get a really good snapshot of a good chunk of the standby services that need to be provided and how many hours does it take? What is really the cost of that? And since they're the ones filling the gap, that's the one that really would need to be filled. Um, I think we would, we would need to take a lot more testimony and do a much more thorough examination of this in order to make this a universal, every single law enforcement agency get, get a sense of every single RFA and standby services. And, and I don't know if that's a practical thing to ask for in the context of this bill, but I'm happy to have other folks disagree with me. I, I understand that totally. So I think that's great. And I think maybe my suggestion would be because I'm really curious now and I bet the network is really curious. My suggestion would be for the network to maybe try to find out that information. How many folks actually statewide from all agencies ask for help in doing this um, and and that's where I was coming from like if I were working at the network I'd want to know I'd want to know how many people out there who are encountering this so for the purposes of this bill no I'll stick with what's suggested I have a feeling if, if we ask for this in statute that we're and given this conversation and the desire that the network has to make sure that survivors aren't a on the hook and b that i have a feeling that uh karen and her colleagues will make sure that we know what we need to know in order to i think so do this better thank, you. thank you thanks for entertaining me thinking aloud I but I think this is a really it, it's a really important issue. I mean, we, we all share a value here, but it's like who pays for it and how do we even know what the real need is? Um, all right. Um, so, Mr. Devlin, uh, do, do you feel like you have clarity from us on what our ask is for this section? Yes, I think so. Yeah, would you like to take the chair? I think we have enough time here before we need to dive back in. I haven't seen anything back from Tucker on our other bill that's <laughs> in progress this morning. So maybe the best use of our time right now would be um, to uh, take a look at uh, 3.1, the others, the other changes that are in there. Um, and then when we come back from the floor, we'll look at uh, an update that includes this new section six language, if that makes sense. And, um, one other comment before moving on from this topic, I'd just like to um, bring your attention that the terminology um, uh, regarding what is a primary law enforcement agency or a law enforcement agency with primary coverage, law enforcement coverage, um, is not defined yet, so we'll have to just insert and determine exactly what that means. Probably something along the lines of um, a law enforcement agency responsible for providing law enforcement services in a certain town, city, or village um, by statute or contract or something along those lines. But I can propose something to figure that out. I just want to point that out right now. Okay, great. Um, um, we'll, we will defer to your expertise and take a look at that. The, the recommended way to define that <laughs> <laughs> when we come back to it this afternoon. Thank you. There's just one real glaring thing on 3.1 that I want to get into before we we see Tucker for the next um, bill. Section 5C page starts at the very bottom of page 10, but then goes into 11. Letter B, the director of sheriff's operations shall be funded by a charge assessed on each sheriff's department. I thought we talked about that yesterday with um, witness Annie Noonan, that there is a position open 
in state government already that could be used rather than um, funding this new position through the sheriff's departments. I thought that that language was coming out and, and I'm not seeing it in the same place. So am I? The here? language being referred to is ah. like section 5C. And it's the session law that's two parts, one establishing the position and one regarding the funding of it. Um, Chair McCarthy, if you'd like, I could kind of talk a little bit about that um, information we've received from JFO. Yeah, because I, I thought we were going to take that uh, 5CB out. So anyway, yeah, let me start. Oh, let me start. I can start by saying you can certainly remove it if that's what the committee would like. Um, when it comes to retitling uh, positions, the um, there is an established sanction process called a classification review in which um, essentially it's a process of looking at the job duties and responsibilities, ensuring that job is kept a comparable pay grade, and that can certainly result in a retitling of a job, especially if it's vacant currently. So that doesn't necessarily have to be um, addressed uh, through session law here. So I think our office is comfortable removing if that's the direction we. So that mean we take out 5C altogether? I think so. And so the references to this new director position that are in the other sections just imply that that position exists and since there's already an exempt position there we can just sort of close our eyes and say we don't need to create this it already exists we're just <laughs> we've looked at it briefly <laughs> okay <laughs> um i can certainly um, verify that with uh, our office's attorneys to make sure there's consensus on that uh, so here, here's what I would say, I'm, unless the committee has another uh, opinion on this, um, is that for now, let's say we're definitely striking 5CB, okay. but that 5CA, we want to get a definitive answer from JFO about whether we need to refer to the existing exempt position in some way, or whether it's sufficient for us to just be referring to this director of sheriff's operations um, and then DSAS sort of has to, by default, fill that position with somebody who would have those mm -hmm. needs. So I think that's the open question on that, unless I'm seeing nods. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, All right progress. <laughs> and for the record, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Council. Before you, you have draft 3.1 of the this committee's strike all amendment to S-17. The differences between the last iteration of the strike all amendment and the one you have before you now have been highlighted for ease of reference. The first series of changes can be found on page two. This is under the section of the bill pertaining to audits, in particular section two, um, which will modify <clears throat> Title 24 of VSA, section 290 Sheriff's uh, County Sheriff's Department. And again, this is one of two sections for change to audits. Here we have, um, let's see, uh, the new language. Um, first few highlights um, provide clarity that there's actually two assistant judges in each county, not just reference to one. And then of substance, you'll see on line 14 through 19, um, language that will create a procedure for when an assistant judge um, potentially refuses to co-sign a disbursement or transfer of departmental, ass departmental assets and will allow uh, the Sheriff's Executive Committee to instead approve such disbursement or transfer if wanted, and then to notify um, both the Sheriff and that assistant judge of that decision if this so she's going to do so. Just wanted to check in with Representative Cooper because I believe uh, of Rumpton, you had a particular interest in this question of yesterday of what happens if a assistant judge just refuses to sign off on any legitimate disbursement that a sheriff that's in the transition period is trying to make um, at the recommendation of the association. They said, well, the sheriff's executive committee could kind of act as an appeal authority. Um, when we put that suggested language in front of Tim, it 
the, the word appeal and that kind of like getting into that legalistic language was a little tough. So the suggestion I think Tim here is that you would just say if the sheriff's executive committee signs off, they can kind of overrule the assistant judge and, and be the secondary approver of last resort. Uh, seeing a nod from Sheriff Anderson. Um, but Representative Hooper, I just wanted to make sure that this kind of as long as there's an avenue. Yeah. I'm happy to read through that new language if you'd like. Yeah, you want to just hit that that piece so we, we're all and um, yeah. the last new sentence reads if the assistant judges refuse to co-sign a disbursement or transfer of sheriff's department assets, the sheriff's executive committee may instead approve the disbursements or transfer of sheriff's department's assets, it shall thereafter inform the sheriff and the assistant judges of the county of the committee's decision. The next part of the strike all amendment that is updated in this draft can be found at page four. This is under the section of the bill pertaining to conflicts of interest. The, and in essence, um, the changes here um, are really reflections of certain comments. Representative Cooper, is your question on the conflict of interest or the side of the back? Okay, yeah, so let's go back first. Yeah. In putting that language in, we're not instilling in the assistant judges any authority to actually block and say, I'm just not going to allow that to happen, putting a judge hat on. No. Um, okay. As laid out here, um, essentially, and I can just, um, I'll quote directly from the to be amended language of this uh, statutory section. Online. Um, Let's see, just starting from three, um, there's certain events that will trigger um, this uh, phenomenon, which all financial disbursements um, or transfers of assets, basically once the sheriff uh, signals that they're no longer going to stay in office, at that point, any transfer of assets uh, needs to be, it says right here, co-signed by the sheriff and at least one assistant judge in that county, and then if that assistant judge in the language skipping down to line five refuses to co-sign that transfer of assets, then the sheriff's executive committee may instead approve um, of that transfer. It's with rogue side judges too. So it, it's really a backstop, right? It's yeah. like a la it's a last resort. And I, I can imagine, like in my county, if the side judge just said no and the sheriff was like. Okay, you know, uh, what am I going to do now? Then the the sheriff would want to go to some other body and say, "I need to sign. I need to do payroll." <laughs> you know, <laughs> they won't let me spend this money legitimately. Um, it, it could get pretty public. I mean, the, if there's a disagreement, so we would hope that this would be a last resort kind of a thing. You remember, Chittenden County a couple of decades ago, the two side judges were fighting with each other and. And, and the previous thing of just one side judge needs to sign off so that there's the sheriff plus some outside of the department oversight during the transition period. Any other questions on that piece? Go on to the conflict of interest changes. So skipping down to page four, we have um, Certain updates that really reflect uh, comments from the State Ethics Commission um, that were uh, given to the uh, committee and discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, really, these changes bring this proposed language here pertaining to sheriffs in particular more in line with the State Code of Ethics. So we have a rephrasing of the first sentence, but the same statutory reference really. Um, and the sheriffs and deputy sheriffs are considered public servants for the purposes of the, what is the definition as laid out in the state ethics code. We also have some tweaking of um, relations um, as to who, what could be considered a conflict of interest between members of family or households. Then also um, a additional part of the definition uh, signaling what is not a conflict of interest. In particular, anything that um, is not greater than that of any other individuals generally affected by the outcome of the matter. So, 
the next part, and actually, Cooper has a question. Sure. <clears throat> this got this got into sort of a question yesterday, and I don't know if it's in this particular point or not. But at one point, <clears throat> you were talking about the financial disclosure form for deputies. That's not a common thing for employees to have to file. I can speak to what is going to be in this update is disclosure, um, annual financial disclosures, but only for sheriffs, okay. not deputies in this bill. And we'll see that later on. That's the more lengthy uh, bit of highlighted material later on. Thank you. Um, I would just like to make a comment on, um, let's see, sub, uh, on subsection C on page five here, which has to do with the reporting or procedures for forwarding ethics complaints, that is, uh, to the State Ethics Commission. Um, in yesterday's discussion of um, 3 PSA section 1223, um, which states that the Ethics Commission shall complaints from any source regarding governmental ethics in any of the three branches of state government or in the state's campaign finance law. Um, there was, um, it was signaled that perhaps this wouldn't cover um, sheriff's departments, but our office's interpretation of this language is that sheriff's department are indeed part of the executive branch, one of the three branches of governments here, so it would be probably covered. But if wanted, this language could be changed to clarity or but that's certainly at the committee's discretion the the next section of updated uh language we have is in subsection d and this um, adds a, a definition for confidential information which mirrors um that in uh the state ethics code currently which states as used in the subsection means information that's exempt from public inspection and copying under Public Records Act, and otherwise designated, or is otherwise designated by law as confidential as well. Yeah, and that last piece just clarified the what we meant by confidential information, right? Yes. The, so, to, just to be sure. really clear to represent the first question, so up until this point, we're saying all sheriffs and deputies fall under the definition of public servants, which means the state code of ethics umbrella covers them. But then in 4A that we're about to go into, we're only talking about the elected sheriff. Yes. Indeed, uh, new section 4A will add a new statutory section, which will be 24 VSA 315 titled sheriffs, semicolon annual disclosure. And this, in essence, will add new annual disclosure requirements for just the sheriffs again. And this is modeled off of the uh, disclosure requirements for um, executive officers found currently in the State Code of Ethics under 3 PSA, Section 1211. And I'm happy to read through this uh, line by line if the chair would like. Um, yeah, I think we can go through this now. Um, the only thing that's given me hesitation it was that I had great hope that we would be able to um, breeze through a draft of the Lyndon and Lyndonville Charter and get it on its way to the Ways and Means Committee. Um, but it's ours in the Senate, I think. So um, we can we can keep plowing ahead here. Um, the this language bef before you get into it is largely taken from what executive officials have to do. It's essentially a carbon copy, just replacing the terms. So that reads, uh, starting on line 19, subsection A, annually each sheriff shall file with the State Ethics Commission a disclosure form that contains the following information in regard to the previous 12 months. One, each source, but not amount, of personal income of the sheriff and of the sheriff's spouse or domestic partner and of the sheriff together with the sheriff's spouse or domestic partner that totals more than $5,000, including any of the sources meeting that total described as follows. A, employment, including the employer or business name and address, and if self-employed, a description of the nature of the self-employment without needing to disclose any individual clients. And B, investments, described uh, generally as investment income. 
Two, any board, commission, or other entity that is regulated by law or that receives funding from the state on which the sheriff served in the sheriff's position on that entity. Three, any company of which the sheriff or sheriff's spouse or domestic partner or the sheriff together with the sheriff's spouse or domestic partner owned more than 10%. Or any lease or contract with the state held or entered into by A, the sheriff or the sheriff's spouse or domestic partner, or B, a company of which the sheriff or the sheriff's spouse or domestic partner, or the sheriff together with the sheriff's spouse or domestic partner owned more than 10%. Subsection B. In addition, if a sheriff's spouse or domestic partner is a lobbyist, the sheriff shall disclose that fact and provide the name of that sheriff's spouse or domestic partner, and if applicable, the name of that individual's lobbying firm. Section C, subdivision one, disclosure forms that shall, sorry, disclosure form shall contain a statement. Oh, I certify that the information provided on all pages of this disclosure form is true to the best of my knowledge, information, and belief, end quote. Two, each sheriff shall sign the disclosure form in order to certify it in accordance with the subsection. Subsection D, subdivision one, sheriff shall file the disclosure on or before January 15th of each year, or if the sheriff is appointed after January 15th, within 10 days after the appointment. Two, the sheriff who filed this disclosure form as a candidate in accordance with 17 VSA, section 2414, in the preceding year and whose disclosure information is not changed since that filing may update that filing to indicate that there has been no change. I'll pause there. I think that seems like pretty familiar language to me. I uh, haven't been through that disclosure language before, but uh, anybody have any questions about this piece? So this was after hearing the executive director Silbert's testimony yesterday, just the idea that there'd be a standard financial disclosure uh, for the elected sheriff. Okay. All right. The moving on to the next part of the bill, which is sheriff's department compensation benefits. See updated language for section five A on page nine. And this section is uh, titled Sheriff's Department Compensation Benefits Model Policy. And you'll see in the highlights in subsection A, a uh, reworking of the language concerning the development of the compensation model policy. I figure it's just easiest to read this straight through. A, on or before January 1st, 2024, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, after receiving input from the sheriffs, the Auditor of Accounts, and the Department of Human Resources, shall develop a Sheriff's Department's Compensation and Benefits Model Policy and submit it for review and approval to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. The Vermont Criminal Justice Council may, in consultation with the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, subsequently alter and update the model policy. And then a new subsection C on the next page is added um, regarding the adoption of the model policy by uh, Sheriff's Departments reads on or before July 1st, 2024, each Sheriff's Department shall adopt the model policy, Sheriff's Department's Compensation Benefits Model Policy. The Sheriff's Department may include additional provisions to the model policy in its own policy, provide that none of these provisions contradict any provisions of the model policy. I'll pause there. So if I can, go back up to a... Um, it sounds like uh, the Vermont Criminal Justice Council uh, may, and, uh, they're, they're going to be kind of the, the ultimate uh, voice of what the policy is. Yeah, as they do with other model policies. I'm trying to balance two things. One is we have the structure where the Criminal Justice Council is kind of the, the main you know, as you did with the, the domestic violence policy, they're kind of the main issuer of the model policies. But really, the creation and the determination of what should be in that model policy is in large part going to happen between the department and the sheriffs. Um, but and the auditor has, you know, DHR all going to be a part of that. So it's it's this thing of making sure that the model policy gets created by the people who know 
about the inner workings of the sheriff's office and, and how different they all are. But then there's this approval that it makes sense and is conforms with best practices really with the Criminal Justice Council. Um, and then at the same time, the subsequent language in our, in, in our testimony and in the feedback that we received from Sheriff Anderson and others, each individual department adopts its own policies. They have to be, when there's a model policy that's been adopted, they have to align and not contradict, but they have specific references and, and can be more stringent sometimes. And so, you know, when I was on city council, the St. Albans Police Department, they went through a multi-year process of every single policy, use of force, all of that stuff, of updating it, making sure that it that our policies match the model policies and then getting approval from the city council on the specific um, ones that they were adopting. So we're trying not to get in the way of this, the normal structure while we're requiring there to be this, this benefits of compensation policy. Okay. Think, think maybe we've gotten there and I'll, I'll definitely ask Sheriff Anderson and others for <laughs> confirmation that uh, we, we finally have hit the mark here. It looks like I'm getting the thumbs up over there, uh, but this has been a, a long, <laughs> long process because I think in the initial drafts, we were in some weird place of sort of saying, well, the Criminal Justice Council is doing this over here. And yeah, it was a little convoluted. So appreciate everybody uh, that all those stakeholders, the department, Sheriff's Association and others kind of setting us straight here. Thank you. The next updates can be found in section 5B. Again, this will amend Title 24 VSA section 367, Title Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, adding a new section E, um, really um, creating, step, uh, creating statutory preference and building out the duties of the now called Director of Sheriff's Operations, which was what was called uh, Deputy Director of Sheriff's in the previous iteration of this. So E1 just changes that name. E2 does as well. Um, also, we'll rephrase uh, the duties more robustly and explicitly in sections two and three. And I'll just read through those for uh, now. Two, the director of sheriff's operations shall provide centralized support services for the sheriffs with respect to budgetary planning, new language, policy development and compliance, training and office management, and perform such other duties as directed by the executive director. Three, the director of sheriff's operations shall develop, maintain, and provide to each sheriff's department model policies on operational topics, including service of civil process, relief from abuse orders, transportation of prisoners, ethics, and sheriff's responsibilities. And here I'd just like to uh, state that including is um, open, um, doesn't exclude anything that's not on this list. So really to be more including but not excluding. The, and then in section 5C, we've already discussed that. That's um, uh, the reference uh, I've noted here to strike 5C subsection B and then confirm with uh, JFO about uh, whether A needs to be referred to in session law. Representative. Sorry, <clears throat> just um, jumped out at me. Page 11, line 13. Um, Sheriff Anderson needs to be capitalized. And I see this is unedited, right? So somebody would have caught that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, uh, we'll try and get, have the, the S capitalized on the new director of sheriff's operations. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see. <coughs> the next updates can be found on page 13, section seven. The section seven that was in the previous iteration here was actually been removed in this draft. Uh, the prior section seven would have required um, sheriffs to provide deputies to courthouses. It's been removed seven A, it's been moved up to seven. And this, uh, which is now titled, Sheriff's Department Provision of Courthouse Security, semicolon report. And this report language is essentially the same, except for it adds um, some other entities into who the judiciary shall consult 
um, in developing this report. Specifically, now the judiciary shall consult with the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, the Vermont Sheriffs Association, Vermont State Employees Association, and then um, for um, and then other relevant stakeholders. And that is the. Oh, and as you know, in section 11, effective dates, there was a reference to the old section seven being implemented at a later date, but because that's been removed, I've removed that reference. In. Yeah, so I think the, the section seven piece is, is, it's very important to highlight for the committee what's not there. So we had a seven and a seven A. The seven was we're gonna provide like one deputy for every courthouse, but we're not gonna have it go into effect until a year from this July. So the July 1st of 2024, now we're, just asking for the report. And I think we will very much have to come back to this uh, once we get the report back and say, how are we gonna actually help the judiciary and the various law enforcement and private security transition to some better, new, hopefully more efficient model, which there's a strong implication here that we would uh, have that report. Um, well, the report is going to consider uh, using something like the transport deputy model for the courthouse security. Um, and so, yeah, there's the implication there that that would be a path for us to uh, potentially get to where we want. Any questions about what's in this draft before we break? We lost Tucker to the Senate, so my hopes have been dashed. Uh, so my plan would be that um, this afternoon we're not going to do our S9 walkthrough. We're going to do, uh, we're going to come back with um, Tucker, hopefully uh, probably do that first, go through the Linden Lindenville Charter, um, and then hopefully that'll give Mr. Devlin enough time here to get us uh, some of the changes we just asked for. Uh, to update this draft. And so we'll do those two things this afternoon if that pleases the committee. Great. Um, well, let's adjourn.